This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, and you're listening to Python's Paradise, and this is your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. The Python Hyena, and I am joined by... Shallow Six from Film Fantasy. Yes, and uh, we have a wonderful guest on the phone, and it feels like we've known her forever. And uh, I, I know I was 10 years old when E.T. hit the theaters. I'm talking about the lovely, the talented, and the beautiful D. Wallace. Hello, D. <laughs> Hello, boys. How are you? Oh, this is like, I, I don't even know how to describe this other than honorable. Like, you know, to have D. Wallace on our show, and there's a, there's a, certain, uh, there's a certain spirit in the air. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. I, I do that. I bring my spirit with me everywhere, hopefully. <laughs> oh, you do? Even in your emails? I wanted to mention something. Uh, we got the Silver Wave Film Festival going on right now in Fredericton, and you were in a film that played here back in 2011 called Killing Ruth the Snuff Dialogues with uh, Doug Sutherland. Yes. One of my, I'm, I'm telling you, you know, I go in, um, I go in as much as I can, um, if the material, if I like the material, you know, and the deal's somewhat doable, to go in and help out young filmmakers, you know, because a lot of times, uh, if they can get a name in their thing, they can get it funded, they can get it out and help get it into festivals and um you know, I, it, it's a way to give back to the people who are starting out in the industry. Yeah, I remember you in that film. You were the the woman in the uh, the home that the, the the hit woman runs into, and uh, it was a really nice little film. And uh, it was it's nice to see you in it. I know Doug Sutherland personally. I've met him a couple of times. Nice guy. Yes, very nice guy. He didn't direct that one, but he has directed some features. But I guess he played uh, Ruth's dad in the film, and you see him in some flashbacks. What, what was your experience? Well, it was. Yeah. You was, know, it was a very quick in and out, down and dirty job for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't get to intimately play with people a lot. You know, a lot of these. Uh, independence that I do and, and festival things that I do, you're in and out really in a day, you know. Mm. Um, so uh, it, it's nice to have a longer uh, a longer deal because you really can bond with people then, you know. But oftentimes it's the only way that we can set it up with schedules and money and, you know, and the part. Sometimes the part just calls for one day. You know, you can do five scenes in one day. Well, um, I think you're probably most famous for doing E.T. the Extraterrestrial. And that's uh, one of three films right now I've seen five times on the big screen, including when it came out. I saw it at the Valley Drive-In here in, in Fredericton. And uh, wow. I remember that well. We don't have drive-ins here anymore. <laughs> I'm a little younger than the Python. I, I was born in 85, and I saw E.T. in 1999 at my middle school. Um, they played it. Uh, they did a screening for it there in the gymnasium. And then, ironically, two days later, uh, my mom came home and said, I rented a movie for you. It's called E.T. You'll like it. You'll watch it more. And I thought, I just watched that. Yeah, it was really good. Okay, yeah. And it became one of my favorite movies. I'll never forget that. I watched it in the gym. And then she didn't even know. And I told her, I said, oh, we watched that two days ago at school. And she goes, what? Oh, well, it's here. And I ended up pretty much wearing out the tape. Well, good. You did your job then. Oh, of course. Uh, E.T. is one of my all-time favorite films. It's such a spiritual film on so many levels. And, you know, the characters yes, are just is. wonderful. And you got to love the little, the little alien E.T. I mean, he's one of the most lovable alien characters I've ever seen for a film. Well, and I I think that's a big a bigger statement that than you realize what you just said. Um, you know, then we've gotten back into oh, aliens are 
bad and they're evil and mm-hmm. they're here to destroy us and all that drama that that humankind loves to live in mm-hmm. for some reason. And, um, you know, I also do, I'm a, a clear audience channel. I do a lot of healing work and channeling work. And really the truth, ET is very truthful about why the aliens are here. They're, they're here to help us. They're here not to interfere, but to help guide us in knowing and becoming the, a, a greater species than we think we can be right now. You know, so it, yeah. it was not by any happenstance that I was called to do that film. You know, Stephen had me into audition for Used Cars, which was a film of his that... That is one of my all-time well. favorite comedies. The one with Kurt, yeah. the one with Kurt Russell. Yeah. When I yeah. first watched that yeah. movie, my guts hurt so bad from laughing, and that's the one with Kurt Russell, where he's a sleazy salesman, and uh, the two fellas are uh, fighting to compete against each other because the uncle or brother, or whatever, was died so many years ago. That movie had my guts just bursting with laughter. It's so funny. Well, I'm glad, but at the box office, it didn't do. No, you know, and that's the problem. It really did. It really didn't, and. I remember when I first watched it, I went and read all about it because I'd seen it by fluke. A friend of mine had it. I watched it. I laughed so hard. I, I rewatched it over again. And I went and read all about it, and it didn't do anything at the box office, and it was a real shame because it was a really good and funny movie. I mentioned it to Python actually a couple months ago. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, used cars. was one of the funniest comedies I've ever seen. Well, I'm still glad that he saved me for E.T., it's all like that. One of the biggest box yeah. office. What do you think of the phenomenon it is all these many years later? I think it's our Wizard of Oz. Uh, I think if you look at movies like Peter Pan and the Wizard of Oz and E.T., um, they have basic truths that when we see them and are presented um, with them through a movie – our hearts and our psyches go, oh, I know this. I know this is true. This gives me hope. Uh, and on a, on a really cellular level, I know this is true. I mean, Peter Pan, you know, think happy thoughts and you fly. Well, you can ask any scientist, any healer, or the religion, the religious people that really do know, that when you feel good, your creation happens a lot faster. When you feel good, your body responds to feeling good. It stays healthier. Uh, do you know that one hour of anger crashes your immune system for five to six hours? Oh, I didn't know I didn't that. know that. Yeah, it's pretty staggering when you start really getting the facts about why all this woo-woo stuff is really scientifically based. So, and then the Wizard of Oz, Glenda at the end of the movie looks at Dorothy and says, you had the power all along, Dorothy. You're the one that has to create getting home. You're the one that has to hold the intention and do the action. And then you get to E.T. and of course, You know, the the prevalent message is keep your heart open. Keep your heart light on and you will get home. You will get back to who you are. You will get back to the creative force that you have. And so every once in a while, an amazing movie comes along and we remember. You know, I And we go, well, why? I want to feel this good. I want to feel this good all the time, and that's why you keep re-watching it, and that's why they play it every Thanksgiving. And, you know, that's my theory on it, guys, because if, you know, you can watch a good movie that's really well-crafted, but it doesn't last forever unless there's something that, that takes your emotion and your spirit and shifts it energetically 
somehow. I mean, uh, my channel is showing me Gone with the Wind right now. Yep. And what's Gone with the Wind about? It's, it's about, you know, truth. And it's about um, don't give up. You can survive. You can make it. Mm-hmm. You can overcome this, you know. And those are our principles that we are hungry daily to experience in our lives. I always found it funny, and uh, I think it was uh, Scream that said this. Uh, in the movie Scream, they referred to uh, you as E.T.'s mom. And yeah. I'm like, can you, like you gave birth to it. <laughs> yeah, but honey, everywhere I go, that's how I'm, I, I'm introduced as E.T.'s mom. And you were stunning in that film. Oh, yeah. Um, Thank you. Last year, uh, I actually watched E.T. at the local cinema here with Python. And after watching the film, it had been so many years since I had seen it, all I could feel was the real spirit and the emotion coming off the film. You know, it's a fun story. It's a love story, you know, uh, about family and I could just feel the emotion coming right out of the movie, and I think that was a powerful factor of it as well. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, you don't get emotional if there's not something in the movie that opens your heart and brings you on that ride. That's very true. And that's... You know, it's a story about family. It's a story about friendship. It's a story about innocence. Oh. And it's a story about trust. I mean, that that little sucker had to trust those kids. And you know, you it's know, interesting they too. They had to trust him. It, it's interesting too because the relationships between the family members were very, very realistic. Uh, they were well written. And it's really cool uh, how far Drew Barrymore has come. I mean, she was just on the Howard Stern show uh, uh, talking about this as well. And I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, she's gone through her, her downs and succeeded and is really, uh, really pulled through in a very positive manner. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I want to take a moment, uh, since you mentioned the brilliance of the writing, to uh, honor Melissa Madison, who was the screenwriter who just passed uh, a couple of days ago. Oh, we did brilliantly not know that. Brilliantly talented, yeah, brilliantly talented woman, kind woman. Uh, she was quite beautiful to work with while we were shooting. Obviously a good screenwriter, because E.T., I think the reason why it connects is because people can relate to the characters and relate to the emotion. Absolutely. She also wrote The Stallion. Yeah, The Black Stallion in 1979. Yeah. Yeah. My heart goes out to her. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I don't know what she passed from. It didn't really say. She just said a long illness. Uh, Um, It's a type of cancer, actually. Um, uh, Neurodorosine green. It's a type. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a... It's hard, type, hard to pronounce. Yeah, yeah, it it is. It's it's a it's a type of of uh, cancer that she passed away from. But it is listed here. But my heart do does go out to her on this day. Well, and and a celebration to her too. Mm-hmm. For yeah, you know, you write one script and it changes the world. I mean, I I have people all over the world that come up to me telling me very personal stories about how E.T. changed their life. Uh, one woman uh, at a sci-fi convention uh, right. came up and with tears in her eyes, she said, I just want you to know you're a part of a miracle in my life and proceeded to tell me that she uh, had an autistic child. She had not ever heard him speak a word for 10 years and she took him to see the re-release of E.T. and on the way home he started saying every line that E.T. had ever said and she said I just had to pull over because I was crying so hard D if you've never heard your child speak and all of a sudden he's just speaking non-stop because of this movie it, she said it's 
it's beyond a miracle, you know, for me to experience that. And I've got, I have just people that come up from, from everywhere. That film heals people. It's a beautiful because film. Because it opens their heart. Yeah, it's, it is. And, you know, I remember watching it and I remember my sister running away in fear at E.T. And I'm sitting there and watching him drink beer and raid the fridge and I'm laughing and I'm loving this little this little friendly innocent alien and then my sister came back and she goes it, what is it and I said he's an alien he just drank beer and then she sat down and we ended up watching the rest of the movie and yeah. when mom asked me did you like the movie I said uh, yeah he, I think he was drunk and she goes uh yeah, at one point, I think. And I'm like, yeah. And I ended up watching it again. And, you know, it was a rental, so we only had it for a certain amount of time. But I, I remember watching it a dozen times, and I loved, the, I loved the film. And I still do to this day. You know, it's an absolute masterpiece. And it's one of those films that has stood the test of time on so many levels, as we all know. And, you know, it's going to be around for a lot lo a longer period of time, too. You know, it's one of those films that will never go away. And, you know, I, I'd like to see Absolutely. this film reintroduced to a younger generation. Um, you wanted to oh, listen. I, I, I had at my table a few weeks ago. I had a ninety-year-old gentleman and a three-year-old little girl. Within ten minutes, that's how many generations this film is still touching. Mm -hmm. And by the way, um, I don't know if your listeners know this, but um, you know we had lots of things that brought ET to life. Um, most of of the ETs were run on hydraulics, and we kept, uh, Stephen had one or two guys on ET all the time in case Drew would come over, because <laughs> Drew didn't know he wasn't real, so Drew would be over talking to him while he was sitting in the corner, so Stephen wanted to be sure and keep that alive for her. And then we had Mimus that uh, did the hand and the arm movements, and we had a little boy who had no legs, and he they would put him in upside down in E.T.'s costume, and he would walk on his hands, and that's how they got E.T.'s signature walk. Wow. Oh, that's how they did it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Wow. You know, that, we, huh? that wonderful scene where he walks behind me in the kitchen. Oh, that was very well done. Oh, that's one of my favorite scenes. It was done yeah, very believably, too. too. Yeah. I remember when you first see him. That was a real treat in the movie, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a really funny scene. Uh, you wanted to talk about your bear. I do want to talk about my bear. Yeah. The... I, this little bear, you see, he's, he's right in brand with everything we're talking about. Uh, I really do know that this little bear could change the world because, well, let me see how quickly I can put this out. First of all, it's a little teddy bear for your listeners, and its sole purpose in life is to help you teach your children or the child within you or anyone else how to love themselves because we are never taught to do that. And very quickly, a lot of people don't know this, your child's brain, our brains, are pretty much completed as far as who we are, how we see our worth in the world, how we see the world uh, seeing us, how we fit in. By the time we're four years old, a lot of it is actually in place by the time we're 18 months. So that means... Uh, a lot of the things um, uh, around our lack of self-worth and self-esteem and self-love, um, we kind of took on before we even had a reasoning brain to figure out what it was. So this little bear has 14 empowering statements. I'm okay. throwing a lot of science in here for people, too, because it's not just a teddy bear. It has statements like, I love me, and the child pushes the paw, and the bear says, I love me, and the child says it back to the bear, I love me. 
And she pushes the paw, and the bear says, I love my body. And the child says, I love my body. I'm going to be great. I'm going to be great. And what it does, in order to create really strong synapses in our brain, we have to have an emotion of fun or love uh, is the strongest one. Of course, negative emotions create synapses also. So we want to create some really positive ones here. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And it does that. They are bonding with something they love, which any psychologist will tell you a bonding object is incredibly important for a kid. And it's repetition and it's first-person statements, which is like affirmations, but affirmations don't work a lot of time because you don't have the other thing like the emotion in alignment with it. So the child thinks it's just this wonderful, incredible, amazing toy, but it's really putting in place what the child needs to be successful everywhere in every subject in their life. And I could not believe you guys when I came up or was given this idea that there's nothing else like it on the market. I just couldn't believe it. But there is now. Awesome. And, uh, they're available for Christmas on the uh, the bear's name is Buppalopaloo. Yeah, but do you the plug. You do that. Yeah, do the plug. You, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just go to buppabear.com. B U P P A bear. Com. I've got the yeah. website up here now, D. Bapalopalu. Oh, dot com. And you know what? I, I think you're an absolute inspiration for creating this toy. I was just reading a little bit ab- about it here. And uh, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, I really don't know what I to know. say about it. This Can thing is just it? phenomenal. You know, and you're such an inspiration for creating this. I'm actually going to buy one of these for my uh, niece. I think she'd really like oh, this. You know, I have so many testimonies already, and yeah. actually I just did a, a private with uh, an older lady, and she said, Dee, I use this bear all the time for me. It just brings me back to my joy and my balance, and uh, we're getting a lot of calls, especially for preteen girls, because of, you know, their self-esteem, again, mm-hmm. is, is so threatened. Mm-hmm. So um, it's been tested for Canada. We ship to Canada, and uh, you can get yours in time for Christmas. And I am, I'm, I'm so I feel like I'm doing, you know, putting back out into the world the same thing that E.T. and Peter Pan and the Wizard of Oz uh, had intended. You know, is that that love and that truth that we really are such amazing beings. Mm-hmm. We're we're magnificent and we got to start claiming that, guys. Absolutely. I'm very inspired I by this. My bandwagon. <laughs> oh, I'm going to I'm going to get one of them for my niece. Cool. I'll yeah. look for your name, darling. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I'll I'll send you an email and everything for it, but I'm going to get one of them for my niece for Christmas. I really think uh, she'd like this, but yet I've never seen anything like this. Dee, this is just inspirational and you're an inspiration for 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 doing this as someone who who cares in the world you know yeah Thank especially you. since Thank um you. Uh, shiloh and i can both attest we both grew up with very low self-esteem and yeah. uh we both managed to beat it wasn't either actually saturday night fever was one of the things that helped me beat it <laughs> uh-huh yeah the magic of movies huh guys we yeah so many so many people but that's why if we if we can instill this in our children by the time they're four, they don't have to spend a lot of their lives, quote, trying to beat it. Exactly, and I agree. You know, they can just go out and joyfully go, well, I want to create this, and I want to do that, and I'm going to have fun being me. And how, how many of us wish we had that, that we're, we were given that? I know? wish I was, yeah. I think everybody, that's that's what we all want to be, is happy. Of course, I think this but thing is revolutionary. It's inside, you know? we got to start inside to be happy. You know, we had um, the pleasure about a month and a half ago 
Speaking of uh, good vibes, we had the lovely, beautiful, talented Belinda Belansky on here. Absolutely love her. We talked about the howling, which I love her. I do. Yeah, we talked about the howling, and that was... And you was in that. Oh, yeah. I got to ask. I worked many hours in the howling on that. I got to ask, Dee, what's it... What was it like working with Dennis Dugan? Like Dennis, Dennis and I had a good time. I he's gone on to direct it. I mean, he was he was a very strong personality, but I really liked uh, working. I I only have fond memories of the Howling, and as you know, um, my fiance at the time Christopher played Stone. my husband yeah. in it. Christopher Stone, yep. God love him, God bless him, and um um. He's no longer so, with us. No, yeah. no, he made his transition years ago. But, you know, we did that whole movie for, I think, $1.3 million. So it was like, let's put on a show. And a lot of times there wasn't enough money for craft service, and everybody had... I remember buying many honey-baked hams to take to the set <laughs> for our crew. So we'd have more you know, food and Joe Dante, our amazing director, um, um, bought those commercials himself because the studio didn't want to, you know, the cartoons and the stuff that's, that's sprinkled throughout the howling, which really brings it up so much to an A film instead of a B film. Oh, absolutely. And Rob Bottin's beautiful, uh, Rob Bottin was on that set every single solitary second. Doing some great um, effects work. Oh my gosh, he should have won. He should have won that year for his effects. Um, you know, but it wasn't a big budget um, studio movie, and it's a lot harder to get the awards those days, anyway. We're still. We still see amazing performances and and production, you know, in um, um, independent films and in horror films, but they're just not recognized for the awards. No, they're, it's it's like it's like a, an unspoken rule that horror films aren't worthy of being up, and it's just really too bad. Well. Like I said, we we loved uh, chatting with Belinda Belansky, and uh, and I I always felt bad when she got killed off in the film, and it's like Dennis Dugan, sh uh, like if I was in his shoes, I would have been there with her, you know. <laughs> and I remember she kind of she kind of chuckled, and she said, "Yeah, I gotta talk to Joe da Dante about that because she got off unnecessarily in uh, Piranha as well. It's like oh, I'm surprised she survived Gremlins." <laughs> but I absolutely well, love her. That's, that's part of the genre. I love Belinda too. I love her as a person. I love her as an actress. Um, and but that's part of the genre, you know, is that people unfortunately get off. People get hacked. <laughs> yeah, and I, I remember I was actually watching uh, Piranha with Python as long ago, and as soon as Belinda went, he, what? No, and I'm like, yeah, well, that's a hard film for you to do. He goes, oh man, and he needed to say oh. he was pissed. Oh, I wasn't happy about that. But that's a, that's really a tribute to her too, because she made you like her and care about her so much. Yeah, I wanted to see her and Paul Bartel hook up <laughs> in that film. <laughs> Another. I don't know, what did she? What does she feel about that? <laughs> I don't know, but it would have been comical. Yeah, go back and ask her there, Python. Um, another person yeah. that w worked on um, on The Howling that is no longer with us, but man, I loved her so much. And Elizabeth Brooks, I mean, she was such a presence in it. She was beautiful. She was sexy. And uh, Canadian. loved her. Yeah, Canadian. Toronto, Ontario. Unfortunately, gone too soon. What was she like? You know, I didn't really work very much with her. Christopher worked a lot with her. Um, my my memory w of working with Elizabeth was that she was not real sure of herself. I think it was one of the first 
major things that she'd done, you know. So we all uh, went out of our way to try and make her feel at home and feel a part of the company. And obviously on screen, it it came off. She pulled it off big time. I, think, I didn't particularly love the fact that she had a naked love scene with my <laughs> with my fiance, but you know, Belinda said you did. didn't show up at the set that day. <laughs> no, no, I and I that was a choice. Uh, yeah. No, oh. I went into town and got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a better alternative, actually. Well, Joe came, and you know, you get to be a family um, with your crew. And Joe um, asked me if I was coming on the set, and I went, you know, Joe, I'm thinking everybody would be more comfortable if I probably wasn't there. And he went, oh, thank God, Dee. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the bars in town <laughs> no, head this and, way. And you had some interesting it, veterans on that film, like Slim Pickens and John Carradine. Yeah, and Christopher spent hours hearing stories from all of them, and they were they were quite amazing to watch and just part of the gang and yeah it was fun it was fun with them um john was quite ill with um um arthritis and you know didn't have a lot of of energy but you never heard him complain he always was there always willing to be off camera um you know, I was lucky. I I got to work with a lot of icons that that were professionals from a time when professional meant that you did your job the best you could with the highest integrity that you could, and you had a responsibility to do that. I work with a lot of young kids today who don't, understand that principle of working and it's too bad um i think it's too bad especially uh for the genre and they you know unfortunately believe their first press that comes out and then three years later who knows where they are you it's a, a business where you constantly have to be improving yourself um where you need to be present you need to give um, back to your craft, and a lot of the young kids don't quite get that. One of the more intense scenes in the film is when you're in that little booth there, and the fellas behind you, and and you're watching that that um, film, that, that porn film. The girl in the film, I tell you, that must have been an intense shoot for her. Yeah, I um, I wasn't present at that shoot, and. Um, yeah, I didn't have to. I didn't have to act very much to pretend to be grossed out by all that. <laughs> it just came into natural play. You know, I'm from Kansas, right? I'm from I'm from Kansas. I'm not square, but I'm not into all that shit. I can tell you that for sure. What's your so, memories of? Um, uh, huh? I was going to ask what your memories yeah. were of Cujo. Oh, Cujo. Well, Cujo is my favorite film of mine and um, only because I think I went as far as I could go in in a really truthful way um, but it was also the hardest thing I've ever done um, they um, treated me for exhaustion for weeks after that and I'm, I'm still on adrenal supplements because I shot my adrenals out you know people don't understand that when an actor um, has a very emotional scene or a frightening scene or an angry scene, your body doesn't know that it's acting. So your body experiences chemically everything that you would actually experience if you were in that situation. And of course, Cujo was all about fight or flight. And by the end, my adrenals were just totally depleted. Absolutely. And once that happens, then you're kind of on adrenal supplements for the rest of your life. So um, I didn't know that. Not that I would have ever turned that tour de force part down. Um, it was just really hard. And I think 
I thanked God every day that I got this kid, Danny Pintaro. Yes. And that Louis Teague uh, took over the directorial efforts. Um, we had another English uh, director the first couple of days that just had an entirely different vision of the film than I did. And ultimately, than the producer did, uh, my beautiful Dan Blatt. And um, so Cujo has a, a very warm place in my heart. And at the same time, every time I think of shooting it, I go, oh, my God. <laughs> it's how exciting. So the movie, the movie did a lot of good for you. Was uh, Stephen King on set for the film at all? Stephen came down for the first day and met everybody and said hi and then took off. Very quiet guy, very reserved, kind of shy. He seems like that kind of fella. Yeah, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with him. Um, I just remember him being a really nice guy, and he certainly says beautiful things about my performance whenever he can, which is greatly appreciated. What were your uh, memories of the Stepford Wives? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> you get to work with Catherine I'll Ross. I I had just gotten to New York from Kansas, and I literally was sitting in this waiting room waiting to uh, interview for a part-time job so I could make some money after I just got there. And the director, I guess their offices were up there also, and he walked out and he looked at me, and he came over and he said, are you an actress? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, do you have a representation? Well, I had commercial representation. And so, but they also handled, you know, uh, feature films and TV. So I gave him gave him my connection, and he called and said, "We, I want her, you know, well, this was a, I had just landed from Kansas. I mean, this is a dream come true. Of course, I didn't have any lines. I think I, I say, yeah, because I'm supposed to be German. And <laughs> actually, I am German, Irish, Dutch um, descent. So it was a look. It was totally a look. And But, man, what a learning experience. I went to upstate New York and talk about three entirely different um, uh, personalities, those three women. Oh, my God. Just total different personalities. And I just got to watch how everybody interacted and did all their stuff and you know, I thought, wow, that, this is pretty good just landing here. I'm in a feature film, and of course, <laughs> a minute. And then I found out what making a career was really about. Although, uh, I, I must say that um, I created a pretty amazing career pretty fast. Yes, you did. Yeah, a lot of it was did. luck. A lot of it was naivete. I, I talk about all of this in my book, Bright Light. And um, available on Amazon. Okay. And um, when I was writing that book, it occurred to me how much my Kansas naivete had added to my success. Uh, because I, I didn't have the negative thought programming, you know, that a lot of people had. I just went, okay, I'm... Hi, I'm Dee Wallace, and I just got here from Kansas, and <laughs> I had that bubbly little Midwestern me, right? you know, and I just followed the breadcrumbs, and just, uh, this is, you know, I had a little buffalopolo in me, I think, and I just went to auditions, and I expected I was going to be okay, and I got my SAG card, or my equity card, Um uh, doing the Millican show because I was a dancer. So I got that from an open call. And I went to a Halloween party. And um, this guy that I went with, his agents were some of the top commercial agents in town. And they thought I was perfect for commercials. So they 
had me come in the next day and find me. Uh, that's what I mean. It, it just it was almost serendipitous uh, the way my career was created. And then I was in New York for two years, and everybody was going to L.A. at the time. Uh, there was actually a joke where the actor from New York and the actor from L.A. met in the Midwest, and they said, go back, go back, there's no work. <laughs> and But I, you know, uh, got in this industrial show for uh, Oldsmobile, and that took me to L.A., and I met up with a couple of friends of mine, and one of them said, well, look, I'm with Brett Adams, which was a really great agency, but I need a commercial agent. And I said, well, I'll get you an appointment with my commercial agent if you get me an appointment with Brett Adams. So Brett Adams signed me. Um, uh, you know, I, I got my first film gig before Brett Adams. You know what I did? I baked chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> You're a sweetheart. You on the lot. You couldn't get on the lot back then. So I baked chocolate chip cookies and wrapped them up and put, you know, casting directors' names. And I went to the garden. I said, uh, I have a delivery, and I have to personally deliver all these to each cast. <laughs> oh, okay. Go on through. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is incredibly so sweet. delivering cookies to Reuben Cannon, and he comes out, and he says, well, come on in. Let's talk for a couple of minutes. While I'm in there... The set calls, and the girl who was supposed to play the waitress, who has five lines, is sick. And he looked at me, and he said, what size do you wear? And I said, what size do you need, honey? <laughs> and that was my first film job. But you see, it, things just came to me because I believed they would, and I believed in myself. And, and that's where I want everybody to be. And that's why I created Bupalapalu. I'm inspired by the bear now. You know, we... <laughs> I am. We just lost, uh, unfortunately, lost Wes Craven. And, of course, you worked with him in The Hills Have Eyes. What's your memories yeah. of him? Oh, Wes was a beautiful, soft-spoken, brilliant man. Um, he knew what he wanted um, he never screamed on the set, which I really appreciate. I, I don't, I don't do well with the screamers and the manipulators. Right. No. Um, and uh, of course, he went on to prove himself to be just uh, a superb movie maker, especially in our genre. So um, that was a tough shoot. The Hills Have Eyes, very, very tough shoot. All of us were in one trailer, and not. A, I spent many you know, nights in my car just so I could have some time alone and maybe sleep, <laughs> you know, or meditate or just have some, it was tough. We would, um, it was almost all night shoots, but it was just a few miles within where they had to put you up per the Screen Actors Guild rule. And so, um, Finally, you know, Christopher said to me, honey, this is too dangerous. You're too tired. You can't drive back and forth every day doing this. So I just got a Hotel 6 and stayed down there a lot of the nights, you know, because it was just, it was hard. It was it was a hard shoot in the desert. Yes. We're either dying of, of the heat or we're freezing at night. Well, I've seen the original Hells Have Eyes, and I absolutely love the film. Um, I have for many, many, many years. I think it's an original psychological scary horror film. I wasn't too fond of the remake to it, but the original. Um, Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah our, Same here. <laughs> yeah, the remake was just. It, 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 yeah, it was bad, and it, it just aimed to sicken, and I didn't like that about it at all. Uh, I thought it was gross. But I did like the original, and there's some really good characters in the film. You know, Jupiter and uh, Papa Jupiter, yeah. Mars. You know, there's some really, really great characters in that film. And um, oh, it's one of the original psychological horror films that I absolutely adore. Yep, I, I am in agreement with everything you said. Yeah. 
And you you stuck with horror even up recently. Like you were in The Frighteners with Michael J. Fox, and you did a couple of films for Rob Zombie as well. What was it like working with Sherry Moon Zombie? I gotta ask that. Yeah, I was meaning that. Oh my God, she she's like a sister to work with. She is beautiful she inside is. and out. Sherry is, and so is Rob. They're just beautiful people. They're very down to earth. They're very real. Um, and Rob really loves and appreciates actors, but you know, he's just a genius. He's just an absolute genius. Um, I don't know an actor that if Rob called, wouldn't go work with him. I mean, it's just, um, he gets actors. He allows you to be free and, and creative and, um, and the two of them together just, well, I hate to use this word, but it's true, darling. Of They're course. Just darling together. Yeah, you worked with uh, them at uh, the remake of Halloween as well as uh, Lords of Salem. Uh-huh. Lords yep. of Salem, I absolutely loved. Like, I remember watching it with an audience, and the audience looked at me going, that was boring and stupid, and I, I, I guess they just were didn't had a tunnel vision it. and didn't get it. But I absolutely loved the artistic, and I mean, if you love – the Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses, you can appreciate uh, the artistic production there and the artistic creation behind the film, then you will absolutely adore The Lords of Salem. And, you know, a lot of people didn't care for the Halloween remake, and I don't care for remakes, but I did like what Rob Zombie really pushed in that film, and I finally got to learn so much about Michael. And, you know, aside from the graphic yeah, bonds, it was a great film. It was film. a remake. It, it was a vision. Was Rob make. It was a vision. <laughs> It was. It was a complete was vision. A, it, yeah. It, yeah. It was based on some of the same story, but it was a Rob make. It, there was no remake there. It was all original, I thought. Yeah. I noticed in your credits, too, that you were, I, and it's been so long since I've seen this movie, and this is not a horror film. You you were in the movie 10 with Bo Derek. Oh, yes. It's been that so was long really since the I've seen it. beginning of my my big career. I was Mary Lewis, the girl at the bar that, um, the sad sack at the bar that Dudley <laughs> takes home and gets it on with and can't get it up with. <laughs> and talk about loving to work with somebody. Oh my God. Blake Edwards and Dudley Moore, you know, and I was starting my career and I went, wow, this is good. Working with people like this, I'm going to love doing this. And then, of course, everybody's not like them, unfortunately. I'm going to make it a but, mission uh, and a priority to see this film immediately. It's been a while. I, I know I've seen it a long time ago, but I don't remember you in it. So that's how long ago it's been. You don't remember my ass? <laughs> we'll put it that's this way, D. I just brought up the poster, and there's a pair of panties and a tank top. <laughs> Someone swinging off a vine or something. So... Yeah, yeah there's... well, that would be that would be Bo, of course. Yes. But, um, no, I I have some uh, nudity from the back, and it took a long time for Blake to talk me into that. Was it very uncomfortable? <laughs> well, sure. I yeah. you know I was just fresh from Kansas, and and I remember Blake coming over and sitting down with me and asking me how I felt about doing the whole scene nude. And I'm telling you, my, my Kansas heart flopped down into my stomach and I looked at him and I said, Mr. Edward, you know, I do a lot of commercials. <laughs> this, is how, this is how green I was. Right? And you know, I I can't imagine my grandmother in Kansas. And what, I I said it. If you want to tell me that I can do three more films for you, so I know that my career will keep going, I I guess I could try. <laughs> That's just inspirational too, you know. I loved it. And the... looked at me and kind of smiled, you know. And he said, "Okay, just ask him." But you see, he was smart. He knew that that was going to throw me off just enough for that scene 
I always loved it in the great race. He he, he managed to, I don't know how he did it, but he talked uh, uh, the lovely Natalie Wood and to get plastered with cream pies. And I always loved that. Oh, well, I'm sure that was a, you know, that was a part of the script. And, and she, you know, I mean, anybody would have done that to be a part of that great film, you know. Yeah, I've got to take a look at this film immediately. This just looks, just reeks of hilarity as well. Oh, 10. Ten. 10's a classic, guys. Everybody go It's to, been like 20 like years since I've seen it. I don't think I have. I think this film. is a film that probably slipped away from me, but not new, not not soon. Yeah. Oh, no. It, there's some some comedy magic in this film. Well, before we let you go, um, would you like to plug up your webpage a little more? Yes, my website, my personal website, and you can find a link to the bear on that also. It's really easy. I am, A-M, I am D-Wallace.com. Yes. And uh, if you want to go straight for the bear, it's Bupa, B-U-P-P-A, bear.com. Well, I tell you, D. I I own a website and uh, I own a small little a little business with it there. Uh, I, I, I do media production and stuff like that on the side. Um, on the website, I can post, you know, a, a page specifically for the bear and promote it and then put the link oh. to go right to the website. I would love that. Yeah, I can do that. Oh, I can absolutely. I'll send... Uh, I'll send you the uh, the link to the website and other, but I can create a, a page specifically designed for the bear and promote uh, it and everything and uh, put the link to go to the website so people can know more about the bear. Oh, I would be so indebted to you. Thank you. Oh, you're Absolutely. very welcome. See, that's, that's what I call give. Absolutely. You now you give and then the world gives back to you. And Absolutely. that's the way it works. But so many of us are waiting for the world to give to us mm -mm, before not we gonna give, happen. and then we stop the flow. Yeah. You know? I've got a couple of quick questions. Well, guys, it's been fun, and I, it's really been great yeah. reminiscing with all these things with you. And thank you for letting me share about the bear, and thank you for your beautiful offer. Oh, you and, know, it was just... I, I, I got one quick question. Where can um, – I'd love to get an autographed picture. Uh, can we do that on your webpage? Uh, actually, if you email me, d at imdwallace.com. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and just request that, then I'll get it out to you. Make sure you mention the show, okay? Okay. And one last thing. Uh, could you uh, plug our show before you go? Yes, if you tell me exactly what to say. Say uh, your name. And then say you're listening to Greg Gilbert and Chris Simpkins uh, at CHSR okay. in Fredericton. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> whoa, slow down. Greg Gilbert and Chris Simpkins. S-I-M-P-K-I-N-S. -I, I always have to spell it out. And then uh, unique. CHSR. 97.9. In Fredericton. At Hold on. This is a freaking lot. Usually I can hear it once and do it, but at C H S R F M. You just put, put M Fredericton. Yeah. M Fredericton? Yeah, Fredericton, New Brunswick, like at Frederick in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Frederick Tun? Yeah. yeah. God, New Brunswick. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm enjoying this. Yeah, it trips off your tongue, dude. But, yeah. All right, let me say this. Hi, I'm D. Wallace. This is practice now. Okay. Hi, I'm D. Wallace, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert and Chris Simikins at CHSRFM in Fredericton, New Brunswick. That's perfect. Did I say it all right? You did. Sure. Damn. Okay. Are you ready? All right, All we're right. ready. Go. Hi, this is Dee Wallace, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert and Chris Simikins at CHSR FM 
in Fredericton, New Brunswick. D, we absolutely love you, You're a saint and, and you've uh, we'll inspired me. We'll promote the bear. Oh, thank you. You're guys. an absolute sweetheart and a saint, dear. You've inspired me quite a bit today. Thank and, you. And you are very you. welcome. And thank you for the opportunity, and thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, when we get this ready, we'll send it to you, and you can post it on your website. Uh, and I will do that. I uh, sure will. Do you want me to send it to uh, Joanne e, or do you want me to send it directly to you? To, yeah, Joni is in my office, so it'll whatever she gets, I get. She's an absolute sweetheart as well. Tell her I said that. I will. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dee. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Dee. You too. Bye-bye. Yep, yep, bye. All good?